You can be seated this morning. Listen, if we're going to pray together, and if you'd like to come and pray here at the front, clearly you can't pray in the stairs, but what you can do is come to the front and turn around right here on the front pews. Listen, there's plenty of real estate here on the pews. No one ever sits on the front row, do they? So there's plenty of space here if you want to come and kneel and, and, or pray right here on the front. You can come and join me. But hey, let's pray this morning. Let's pray as a church and let's ask the Lord to bless and move um, during this holiday season. Listen, I know that uh, you're around friends and family members and other individuals that are uh, close and near and dear to your heart. And you're in these family gatherings. We want to pray for them this morning that they would come to know Christ if they don't know Jesus as their Savior and their Lord yet. And you have an opportunity to bear testimony to them, influence them uh, in a positive way. And we just want to pray for our friends and our family members who desperately need Jesus. We have friends and family members who need Christ. And we pray for them often as a family. And uh, some of them we may be around this Christmas season, but we're just a couple weeks away. Let's pray for them and let's ask the Lord to move uh, not only in them, but also in the rest of our service, okay? Let's join in prayer this morning. God. As we come to you today, thank you for the gift of music. Thank you for the gift to be able of, of being able to come and take old music, Lord, as we've just been singing, and do it in a new way, and worship you in a new way, uh, in a new style. God, thank you that, Lord, we can creatively worship you as we see in the Bible and the Old Testament that flow in the New Testament, Lord. You showed us the creativity of your hand, the creativity of our hands that, God, you have made us to be, to worship you in new and and, and in fresh ways. So God, thank you for the work that you've been doing in the life of our church over the last months and years. And God, we just thank you this morning that as we come into this room, we have a reason to sing, Lord. We have a reason to sing. We have a reason to worship. Because God, you are worthy of our worship and you are worthy of our praise today, God. Lord, we are unworthy to be before you right now. We think about our lives, we look into our mirrors, we look into the depths of our hearts and we see sin and we see brokenness and we see that on our best day, Lord, we still fall short of your glory. We still fall short of what your expectation is of our lives. And yet we come into a room like this, Lord, and we are humbled that God, we can pray to the the creator of the universe, the creator of all things, the one who has all the answers. You have all the answers. We deal with so much in our lives, day after day after day. And yet, God, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our lives may change, but you never change. Circumstances around our lives may change, but, Lord, you never change. You are the same God to us as you were to Moses, to Abraham, to the disciples, to the Apostle Paul, you are the same God that we pray to, the same God that we worship. And we thank you, Lord, this morning for the gift of the church. Because God, not only have you set aside and made it um, an expectation that God just, that we would come together, that we would covenant ourselves together as church members and be a part of a local church. But Lord, you've done this so that It is beneficial in our lives. God, we thank you for each other. We thank you that we can pray for each other, that we can encourage each other, that we can take your word and we can speak truth into the life of each other, that we can encourage each other because we need each other. Lord, we all need you and you've made this possible, Lord, the local church. So God, there is no place that we want to be on this Sunday morning than to be together. And so thank you for this beautiful gift. Thank you, Lord, as we look around this room, we see the creativity of your hand, for Lord, none of us are the same. We come from different generations and we come from different backgrounds. We look different, we sound different, but Lord, we all have this common understanding that Lord, your Holy Spirit lives inside of us because we've given our lives to you, Jesus. And so we come from this table that we just remembered and celebrated, to music that we began to sing and celebrate, to a place, Lord, where we come to you in prayer, where we claim and proclaim to you that we need you. We need you, Lord, to step into our our lives, to step into our family's lives, to step into our friends' lives. God, we know this morning that you have saved many of us in the room. Not all of us, Lord, but you have saved many of us in this room. And God, our hearts are broken because we come to you this morning on behalf of of our friends and our family members who do need Jesus. 
And oh God, that you would put us in places and, and allow us to be in situations and in circumstances where we would, Lord, have the chance, the privilege, the honor to speak truth into the lives of our friends and family members, God. And that we would point them to you, Jesus, because you are the one that brings life. And we have found that life, a life that cannot be found in this world, cannot be found by any other religion, cannot be found by any other God that is false, but Lord, only in the God of the Bible, the God who made all things, the one in which we proclaim and believe in, the one in which sent his son, Jesus, into the world to save, and you gave us the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, the one that unites us, the one that gives us the peace, the one that gives us the joy, the one that gives us the things that God you've promised that only can be possible because we are born again. God, we pray for our friends and family members that they would be born again like us. And so we give them to you and we commit them to you. We commit their names into your ears because God, we know that you listen to us. God, bless this time in your word. For Lord, we want to experience and understand what your word says to us today. We want to experience you. We want to know what you want to say to us, Lord, because every week you have a word for us. And so, Lord, would you take away the distractions from our hearts and our minds? And would you help us to focus singularly on your voice in our ears and in our hearts? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning once again. So good to see you again. And I want, you to, I want to encourage you to take a Bible. Turn to Luke chapter 1. As you can tell on Sunday mornings, we are bouncing around a little bit. But uh, we're going to look this morning at Luke chapter 1. And I want to share with you a, a very short, uh, uh, very powerful story in part from uh, the New Testament. It comes in Luke chapter 1. And we're going to be in verse 67, starting in verse 67 this morning. We are all in a season of waiting. If you click that button and you order from Amazon.com and you have not ordered your Christmas presents, you are waiting. You with me? If you have not gotten your Christmas presents and you're waiting, you're waiting for the mail to show up. No, we're all in a season of waiting. We all have these times when we are waiting for specific things in our lives, aren't we? We're always waiting for something. We're waiting for the, for the light to turn green. We're waiting for all these things to happen when we're stopped at a stoplight or when we're, we've, we've, uh, we've looked for a package and we've shipped and we've sent off for a package and hasn't shown up yet. We're waiting for people to show up. We're, we're always waiting. There's a man in the Bible who we are going to see this morning. His name was Zechariah, and he was also waiting. And what he was waiting for, as we've been singing this morning about, is he was waiting uh, uh, waiting a long time for the Lord to come. It was waiting a long time for the Lord to come, much like the rest of the Israelites were. And we're going to see here this morning that once his mouth is open and his voice is opened, his, his ability to speak comes back, this is what he says. I want you to look with me at verse 67. I'm going to explain it, and I'm going to just explain the backstory in a minute. But look with me at verse 67. I'm going to read for us from the Bible there. You just follow along with me as I read. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, this is what he says. He sings a song, a song of salvation. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our families or to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and in righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will, be, will, will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercies of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give you, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And the child, which is John the Baptist, by the way, in verse 80, and the child grew and became strong in spirit and he was in the wilderness until the day 
of his public appearance to Israel. Zechariah is the dad of John the Baptist. What a song that he sings. There is a difference between joy and happiness. There is a significance difference in joy and happiness. For example, you may have lost a loved one this year. And you come to the Christmas season, and everybody's talking about joy. But you're sitting there crying. You're sitting there weeping because you're missing your loved one. It's not a season of happiness for you. 1994, I lost my grandmother. I was in college, and she came to one of my football games. And I still have this picture of her in her, in her dress that she would, would wear at my football games. It was in the colors of my university. In 1994, I was in college at the time she had come to one of my games, and she was decked out. She had the earrings, and she had the pretty dress on. And I'll never forget that fall, getting the phone call from my parents that she had set up in her chair at home and had a massive heart attack and died. And I never got to see her again. And I'm going to tell you that when I came near to that Christmas season, you know, I was not happy about that. In fact, I was pretty sad about that. When I saw my grandfather and I saw the look on his face after all those years of marriage, having lost his best friend, having lost his spouse, some of you have been there. You're not happy, and there is a difference in happiness and in joy. Because here's the thing. You can come to a place of unhappiness in your life because happiness is determined by the circumstances that change in our life. Am I right? Like losing a loved one. Then you can come into a worship service or you can come and you can sit before the Lord with your Bible and you can sit before him and you can worship him and understand that there is still this undergirding joy in your life. There's a difference in joy and happiness, a major difference. Circumstances change. Circumstances will dictate whether you're happy or you're not happy. Joy remains. And in moments where you experience that unhappiness in your life, listen, when you experience that unhappiness, joy is what is underlaying in your life, or it should be. Why? Because there is joy in Jesus. There is joy in Jesus. No matter what losses you incur, no matter what difficult things incur in your life, no matter how many difficult seasons or situations that you experience in your life, there is the undergirding, underlaying foundation of joy in your life because there is joy in Jesus. When Christ comes, when Jesus Christ comes and when he comes again and understanding when, that the fact that he is coming again, Despite the times of unhappiness, despite the times of difficulties, despite the, 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 the seasons that where your circumstances are going to shift and change, then I want you to understand that there can be joy in your life. Zachariah certainly experienced this joy. I want you to look with me because what we see here is this, these, these um, incredible things that take place in the life of Zachariah. Now, who is Zachariah? Let's just talk about that first, and then we'll get into the, the, the meat of the text of what we're going to look at this morning. Zechariah tells us in Luke, Luke actually opens, if you just turn one page over to chapter 1, Luke opens with this story of John the Baptist, John the Baptist being foretold, okay? You see that little heading in your Bibles. Learn to understand and read your Bibles in this way. So John the Baptist, it says in chapter 1, verse 5, it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named what? Zechariah, you open, I see you have your Bibles open, good, of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So you've got a Zechariah and you've got Elizabeth. And here is what happens. And they were both righteous before God, that's key, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord, but they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. So here's the backstory. You've got Abraham and you've got uh, you've got Elizabeth, and they're older in the sense that they cannot have kids. No one looks at them and says, hey, are, are, no one's coming to them and asking them, hey, when are you going to have kids? Hey, when are you pregnant? When are you going to be pregnant? No one's coming to Elizabeth and asking that anymore. Maybe when she was younger, but not anymore. And so those questions have faded. That hope has faded, and they have kind of moved into the season of being barren for the rest of their life, and they're just kind of settling in when it comes to that until verse 11. 
Because in chapter 1, verse 11, look at your Bibles with me. This is what it says. And there appeared to him, meaning Zechariah, an angel of the Lord standing on the, right, on, the, on, the, on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said to him, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Because this is what he's going to do. He's going to blow his mind. He's going to blow his, uh, he, he's, going to, he's going to just rock their world, so to speak. Zechariah and Elizabeth both. And he promises that there is going to be a child that's going to come to them. It's hard for him to believe that because they're older. It's hard for them for him to grasp that. And so in this moment, he couldn't believe the news. He doesn't believe the news. That's the story of chapter 1. He, he doesn't believe that Gabriel who comes and this angel who comes and speaks in this, into Zechariah's life that a child is actually going to come. And so, as a result of that, here's Zechariah who falls under the judgment of God. Look at verse 19 and then in 20. It says in verse 19, the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news, not bad news, good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So here's Zechariah under the judgment of God. Here is Zechariah who is under this judgment, who cannot speak until the birth of his son, John. Now I want you to just put yourself in his position. It's hard for us to do that. <laughs> but here is Zechariah, a man who cannot speak for nine months, the whole term of his child. Maybe Elizabeth was clapping for that. I don't know. Okay. But nonetheless, Zachariah cannot speak. He cannot utter a word. He walks around with a tablet and he's writing what he wants. But he, think about the, the life that Zechariah is living. How much time he spent with the Lord. How, much moment, how many moments he spent just in silence and in solitude with just him and the Lord. For nine months, he is sitting, sitting before the Lord. And at the end of the nine months... They say his name is going to be John. Not Zechariah, but his name is going to be John. At the end of the nine months, God opens his mouth. God begins to help him to speak, and he speaks the words in which we just read. And then if you've been alone for nine months, not being able to speak, not being able to talk to anyone, not being able to, 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 to talk to your wife or to talk to your friends or to talk to people around you, and the first, the first thing you would say is you would probably go to the people that you love the most and talk to them. But no, what does Zachariah say in chapter, chapter, at the end of chapter 1? He bursts out in this song of salvation, this song of joy. Because that's where Zechariah is. He has spent so much time with the Lord. Jesus is the reason for joy. Understand that. He understands that. But here, the Lord opened his mouth. And the words out of his mouth are this song of salvation. And I want you to notice just several things about this song of salvation. Look down at verse 76 of what he said. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. The Most High. He knows John's occupation. He knows why God's brought John into the world, their son into the world. It's not to celebrate John the Baptist. It is to celebrate the one who is the most high who is coming. Because he says in verse 76, for you will go before the Lord and prepare his ways. He knows, his dad knows what John's purpose is. He knows why God has given them the son. And out of this silence and solitude, he sings this song of salvation, not about his son, but about the one who his son is going to proclaim and go before. Now, I want you to notice just several extraordinary things that he says here in his song. First, I want you to notice the change in his confidence. Look at verse 68 with me again. He says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Listen, nine months before he doesn't believe, he can't believe that God is going to give John to Elizabeth and, and him. But here nine months later, he is so confident that that's going to happen. Not only that that's going to happen, that that has happened, that he is now confident that Jesus is going to come that this Messiah is going to come. He believes that all of it has already happened. It's in the past tense. Notice that. The birth hadn't even taken place yet. Jesus hadn't come yet. Jesus Christ had not come yet. 
But what does he say? It's all in the past tense. Blessed be the Lord and God of Israel, for he is what? Is going to visit? No, he has visited. He has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a sword of salvation. Someone say amen in here. Y'all are staring at me. Have some joy. Jesus has come. And this is what Zechariah is putting before and is singing before the Lord. First words out of his mouth is song of salvation. He's confident that it's going to happen. He's confidence in his confidence in the promises of God have grown. They have grown. And so he has faith. He has faith in the redeeming work of the Messiah. Listen, this is what faith looks like, y'all. What faith looks like in our lives is understanding in, in having this belief, this firm belief in the promised words of God. When you come to the Bible and when you open the Bible and you read about the promises of God, believe them, it should offer, it should bring you to joy. That's the essence of faith. What does Hebrews chapter 11, 1 say to us? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the promise or it's the conviction of things not seen. We sit here this morning, we go through these, these kind of things that we're doing this morning, not out of ritual, not out of trying to make ourselves feel really super religious or hyper-religious. We are doing these things to remember something that is already true, something that has already happened, something that already will happen. Zechariah is just simply praising God for what is going to happen, and he's already doing it in the past tense. He has this growing confidence in the work of God. Secondly, Jesus is coming... I'm sorry, Jesus is God visiting our world. This is what he proclaims in his song. If you look back at verse 68 again, he says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has redeemed his people. Listen, Jesus is the one who is visiting our world. Think about this for a moment. That for centuries, for centuries they have waited for Jesus to come. It seemed that God had neglected them. It seemed that God had forgotten them. They were living alienated from God. There were hundreds of years between the Old Testament and the New Testament where God had not spoken. It's hard for us to imagine because we have the Word of God laying in our laps. You had it sitting you in front of you. You have it on beautiful screens in front of you. You have it at home on little pieces of paper and up on your walls, right? You have it on your phones, but you've got to understand that we have the Spirit of God now. We have the Word of God now. But, but there was a different season for God's people. They were waiting. They were listening. They were, there was silence from God for so long. God's people were in this season of expectation. There was a spirit of prophecy, and that spirit of prophecy had stopped. God had not sent prophets to the people. Israel had been taken over by Roman occupation. They're waiting for God to come. They're waiting for God to show up. They're waiting for God to do something and visit them. In fact, in chapter 2, verse 25, Simeon, this famous story of Simeon when he holds Jesus in his hand. Look over at chapter 2, verse 25. We sang about it a while ago. But this is, he says this, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout. Listen, look at what, he, what it says about him and what, how he's described. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the visitation of Israel of Israel to, to come, the Holy Spirit was upon him. I mean, this is where the people of God were. They were waiting, y'all. They were waiting for Jesus to come. They didn't even know his name. They were waiting for the Messiah to come. They were waiting for someone to come and redeem them. But here is this announcement that Jesus Christ is coming. Verse 68, blessed be the Lord and God of, our, of Israel, for he has visited and he has redeemed his people. The coming of Jesus is God visiting our world. But I want you to notice a third kind of very remarkable thing about what, what Zacharias says. God visited the world. Why? Why did Jesus visit the world? To redeem the world. Verse 68 and verse 69. Again, we read them a moment ago. We read them just a moment ago. It says, and he has visited and what? He has redeemed his people. He has raised up this horn of salvation for us. Listen. Luke understood the degree in which all of this was taking place. Zechariah probably didn't understand it. When Luke is writing this, he understands it. Zechariah doesn't. He is simply celebrating the fact that, that, that the God is going to redeem them. Now, there's hints of this in the Old Testament in Isaiah 53. And you can go back and look at that, this, this redemption that is going to come. But there is no full understanding of what Jesus is going to do. 
Jesus is not going to come and, and simply redeem or to deliver the Israelites from their occupation of the Romans. He's coming to redeem them from what? Sin. He probably understood the same that Moses under, Zechariah probably understood the same that Moses understood. Way back in Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, listen to what it says. Let me get there. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Zechariah, as he is celebrating this song of salvation, he's thinking about this. He may not be thinking about the salvation of sin. He's thinking about the occupiers, those who are occupying the, the Israelites at the time. But he was certainly hoping that God would come and redeem his people from this. God visits us. But look at, look at what it says. There's this extraordinary thing that he says next. He visits and he redeems through the what? The horn of what? Salvation. And so he raises up in verse 69, a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. What a picture of the Christmas season, the horn they don't think in terms of a horn up here, someone blowing a horn, okay? Think of the running of the bulls. You know what I'm talking about? The running of the bulls. Think of someone, it's not a musical instrument, think of someone who is running the bulls in Spain. You get the bull, you what? You get the horns, right? If you mess with the bull, you get the horns. Think of that kind of a horn, okay, this morning. But this is what he's saying. He's saying this is the, what we see in the Old Testament, this coming of the Holy Spirit that is prophesied, the, is prophesied way back in the Old Testament and is coming from the lineage of David. In the Old Testament, the horn of salvation, and we read this from time to time and place after place, came from the lineage of David, but it referred to, uh, uh, referred to, to God, to, to man. It saves his people. God's defense God defense and, and, uh, and his offense upon us. He secures us and he saves us with this horn of salvation. And so look at verse 69 again there. He says, and he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant J David. Jesus is the horn of salvation that Zechariah is prophesying, is talking about, is singing about. He's the one who will destroy the enemies. He is the one who will step into our life and, and destroy the strongholds in our life. But there is something deeper and there is something more liberating than liberating people from oppression. It's liberating us from our sin, which leads into this last kind of extraordinary thing that what we see here this morning in Zechariah and what he says. You see, he does this for a purpose. Why does God step into our life in verse 68 and verse 69? Why does he visit us? Why does he redeem us? Why does he save us through his son, Jesus? with his horn of salvation. We'll look down at verse 74 and 75, that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. You see, the purpose that God redeemed us, the purpose that God visits us, was to produce something in your life. This is the gospel. What the gospel does in our life is, is not to design to, to somehow take you out of something only, but it is also to put you into something. There is a twofold purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ in your life and in my life. It's not just to redeem you or to take things out of your life, but it's also to put things into your life. Jesus came to lead you out of a life of fear, the fear of evil, the fear of the unknown. He engages us, he encourages us, he enables us. And what he does is he replaces the fear of man with a fear of him, with a fear of God. And what Jesus did is he came for you to commit your life to this life of holiness and righteousness. You know how you first worship the Lord? How you first worship him is not just through a song, it's not through any of the things that we do. It's by first and foremost giving your life to him. When you give your life to him and when you surrender your life over to him and you turn away from sin and you start to follow him with your life, then God replaces this fear of man with a fear of him. And you begin to follow him fully and wholeheartedly with your heart. 
Jesus is the, is, the, is the reason for joy. Jesus is what gives us this joy in our life. And this is how we experience that joy, because the Lord has come, and the Lord is coming again. He redeems us through the horn of salvation. And what's the result? The result is always going to be joy when we begin to pursue a life of holiness and a life of righteousness. You can't appreciate this until you appreciate the need. For example, $10 to a rich man is going to be received differently than $10 to a poor man. Someone who knocks on your door at three in the morning for no reason is going to be received differently than someone who knocks on your door at three in the morning to tell you that your house is on fire. You're going to be received differently. The news is going to be received differently. Listen to this quote. We do not appreciate gifts that meet no needs or satisfy no desires. We don't value or love and offer for help unless we know we are without. In all my time of talking to people about Christ individually, most people experience their need for Jesus the way a rich man t receives a $10 bill. They don't really see the need for it. May take it, put it in his pocket, may take it and say, oh, no, no, give it to somebody else that needs it. Give it to somebody else that wants it. I'm good. And a lot of times what people don't experience that, they don't experience the need and they don't have, they understand the need that they have for Jesus Christ. Most people look at Jesus as a $10 bill to a rich man. But understand this this morning. Celebration is focused on family this time of year. It's focused on the giving of gifts and the end of the year off, time off at the end of the year. All of those things are good. All of those things we should celebrate. None of those things are bad, but there's a real near danger in our life. It's a very clear danger in our life this Christmas season. We have to come to grips with what the New Testament tells us. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. We understand that the, 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 the Lord of this world has blinded our eyes from really desiring to know and having our need for Jesus Christ and seeing our need for Jesus Christ. Well, there is an enemy, and he consistently blinds us he consistently blinds us with all kinds of things in our life. But Jesus brings true joy. And I want to remind you this morning that when Zechariah opens his mouth for the first time, he does not talk about his son. He does not talk about uh, the things that he's been dying to tell his wife and talk about with his wife. He bursts out in a song. Why? Because he believes and he understands that he has a tremendous need. And that need is coming to be fulfilled by God visiting and redeeming their lives and raising up this horn of salvation. His son just has one big small part of it, one small part of it. Listen, we all have this need. And the encouraging thing for the child of God is that I may experience unhappiness in my life. I'm going to experience loss I'm going to experience tough days and difficult days, but I can have true joy because true happiness flows out of a knowledge of God and of, of understanding and rejoicing in his works and his faithfulness and his covenant towards me. That's what true joy is about. That's what enables us to sing that joy, but I have to receive it first. And if you're here this morning and you haven't received that joy, let me say to you this morning that God wants you to turn away from sin and start following him. You know, God is perfect and he's holy in every way. Just means there's no sin in him. We see that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. He's perfect in every way. Sin cannot be in his presence. And at the same time, the Bible tells us about man, that you and I are broken and we are sinners. And because of our sin, we can't be in the presence of a holy God. But God doesn't want it to be that way. He doesn't. And so the solution that he provided was his son, Jesus, which is what we celebrated this morning, which is what we remember this morning. 
And he came and he died the death that I deserve. And he was sinless all the way to the cross. He shed blood on the cross. His body was broken on the cross. And then three days later, he rose from the dead. And the Bible says that if I give my life to him, if I start to follow him fully with my life and turn away from myself and I follow him and him alone, everything that Jesus did on the cross is now applied to me. Everything that he did from the grave, his life, is applied to me. And that may be where you are this morning. You haven't surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. And we want to give you an opportunity to do that. So I want to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. You know, and as we are about to pray, our worship team's going to come, and they're going to lead us in a song together as they always do on Sundays. You know, as we sing together and as we worship here in just a moment, God is speaking to you, if God is speaking to you about salvation or you just need prayer over a particular matter, maybe God is speaking to you about joining our church or being baptized here at Central into our fellowship. Maybe God just is speaking to you about a particular matter or you want prayer over a particular person that you've been sharing the gospel with. Listen, we're going to be here at the front. And while we sing, we want to encourage you to come down as we always do. To come down and make decisions or pray with us, we'd happy to be, we would be happy to pray with you if you just want to come and pray. But you have the courage to come this morning. Let me pray for us, and then we'll sing. God, as we, think, we pray this morning, we believe that, God, you are here among us and that you're working among us. And Lord, we just pray this morning, God, that you would give us the courage to respond to you and to respond to your word. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand with us and sing?